All right, you're in the Leviticus class, Leviticus for Beginners. Uh, this is lesson number six in the series. Uh, the uh, title of the lesson, Attaining Holiness. Uh, we're talking about the sin and the guilt offerings. This is part two of that uh, particular material. We'll be covering uh, Leviticus chapter 5, 14, all the way to chapter seven, verse 10. I hope that you have read up. So um, we're looking at the various types of sacrifices made by the priests, first at the tabernacle and later on when settled in the promised land, the same sacrifices and the same offerings were made at the temple. Just for review purposes, the five types of sacrifices, the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, the peace offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings, which is what we're going to look at in today's lesson. Now, I've mentioned several features uh, that we need to keep in mind that were associated with the different kinds of offerings. For example, offering physical sacrifices according to instructions was a way of attaining and maintaining a holy status before God. We've uh, quoted this before, but uh, in Exodus 19, God says, I am holy, therefore you must be holy before me, meaning the Israelites. If, if, if you're going to be my people, I am a holy God, therefore you must be a holy, um, a holy people. Uh, and one way to attain this holiness was to offer sacrifice in the proper way. Another point that we made, each type of sacrifice had a specific purpose. For example, the burnt offering was for forgiveness and mercy in general. The peace offering was a request for God to bless the, uh, the offer, uh, the offerer. Uh, the grain offering was to show uh, gratitude. The sin offering was uh, atonement and forgiveness for a particular sin. I lied, I cheated, you know, I cheated my friend out of, you know, certain amount of produce or something, a particular sin. That was the sin offering. The guilt offering and atonement, of course, uh, was for a, a sinful attitude, uh, an ongoing sinfulness. I realize that I am a, uh, an arrogant man and, and, and very proud and uh, this has caused the conflict and so on and so forth. Uh, I will offer a guilt. I acknowledge this about myself. I will offer a, gui a, a guilt uh, offering. And then the uh, requirements for the various offerings were based on wealth. For example, the priest would offer a male, if he was the sinner, if he was offering a sacrifice for his sin, the priest, especially the high priest, would offer a male bull without defect for his sins offering, uh, whereas a very poor man would only offer, uh, you know, several pounds of uh, fine flour. Big difference in the cost of these two items, a bull and a few pounds of flour, and yet they produced the same result at the end if they were offered correctly, and that was atonement for the sin, forgiveness for the sinner. Uh, a bull today, uh, maybe $5,000, so a couple of pounds of flour, five, six dollars, you know, but it didn't matter. What was important is uh, was that the sacrifice was offered in the, in the proper way. Note, however, that uh, both sacrifices properly offered produced atonement and forgiveness for the sins. So we're going to talk about the guilt offerings in chapter five of Leviticus. Things get a little confusing here since only part of the instructions are given. And the reason for uh, this um, uh, the reason for the guilt offering and what is supposed to be offered. How this guilt offering is to be made is only provided in chapter seven. Remember I said the book is divided in two ways. The first part of the book uh, explains what the offerer, the person, the sinner, what he is supposed to do, you know, his part in offering the sacrifice. And then in the second part of the book, 
uh, you have the instructions for the priest, what the priest is supposed to do in that situation. So how this guilt offering is to be made is only provided in chapter seven. In the meantime, Moses provides more information about various gifts, uh, excuse me, various types of guilt offerings and their significance. And he explains it from the perspective of the sinner, the one who's making the offering. So the source of the law regarding the guilt offering, we read in chapter five, verse 14, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, there's the source of the law. How do we know this is a law? How do we know this is what we're supposed to be doing? Because the Lord spoke to Moses and gave Moses instructions concerning these things. So this formulaic uh, introduction not only provides the source for what is to follow, you know, God himself, a divine inspired source, uh, not only gives you the source of the information, but also indicates that a new topic is about to be introduced. So whenever you, you know, usually at the beginning of a chapter, whenever you read, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, a new topic was being introduced. So the new topic will be the guilt offering. Various translations have this guilt offering. They call it in other uh, Bible translations, for example, they call it the trespass offering or the reparation offering or the sacrifice to make things right, all different ways to refer to the guilt offering. The guilt offerings were made and prescribed for two types of sins sins against the Lord's holy things, or breaking his commandments specifically, and sins where someone's property was taken or damaged. So the uh, guilt offering was made for those kinds of sins. Unlike the other types of sacrifices, the guilt offering included some manner of restitution or compensation to the injured party. So let's talk about guilt offerings for sins against God's holy things. Let's do that first. And we'll read Leviticus chapter five, verses 15 and 16. If a person acts unfaithfully and sins unintentionally against the Lord's holy things, then he shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your valuation in silver by shekels, in terms of the shekel of the sanctuary for a guilt offering. He shall make restitution for that which he has sinned against the holy thing and shall add to it a fifth part of it and give it to the priest. The priest shall then make atonement for him with the ram of the guilt offering and it will be forgiven him. So holy things could be sacred property or tithes or things associated with the building itself, you know, the tabernacle or the temple itself. Uh, for example, the person could have acted unfaithfully, like Nadab and Abihu who offered strange fire. Or a person could have acted unintentionally by forgetting to offer something in the proper way uh, to God. For example, a person uh, uh, forgot to bring the first fruits as a sacrifice for the benefit of the priests, uh, you know, neglected to do that, or unintentionally eaten the priest's portion, or perhaps the person made a vow to God and forgot to pay it. So these are sins against God, sins against the holy things. The guilt offering required that he determine the value of what he forgot to do, or the value of the portion that he took or he used by mistake, and then add 20% value in compensation. In other words, the value of what he took or neglected to give and 20% on, on top of that. In addition to this, he was obliged to offer a ram to make atonement and to receive forgiveness for that particular sin. The manner in which this was to be done is only given, as I said, in the following chapters. Because here it's just the responsibility of the sinner Later on, God explains, or God gives to Moses the information as to what the priest is supposed to do in a case like this. 
Let's talk a little bit uh, about guilt offerings for other sins requiring sacrifice. And we read about that again in Leviticus chapter five, beginning in verse 17. Here it says, now if a person sins and does any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, though he was unaware, still he is guilty and shall bear his punishment. He is then to bring to the priest a ram without defect from the flock according to your valuation for a guilt offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his error in which he sinned unintentionally and uh, did not know it, and it will be forgiven him. It is a guilt offering. He was certainly guilty before the Lord. So this uh, referred to sins which were forbidden in God's law but were done in ignorance or they were done unintentionally. Uh, breaking of God's law, even if done unintentionally or in ignorance, still made the person guilty and subject to punishment. Again, as we mentioned previously, ignorance was no excuse. Forgiveness uh, was still required and uh, it required an animal sacrifice, a ram in this case without defect, offered in an appropriate way, well, we'll read about that later on in chapter seven, in order for atonement and forgiveness uh, to be uh, given. No compensation here is mentioned for this type of offense since the individual is not aware of what specifically he did wrong, only that his conscience is aware that he has fallen short for one reason or another. Now we discuss, uh, or in the scriptures, we move on to chapter six, and here they discuss offerings, guilt offerings, that involve the property of other people in chapter six. So let's read a couple of verses in chapter six. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Notice the formula here. You know, then the Lord spoke to Moses. That means we're going on to another subject. When a person sins and acts unfaithfully against the Lord and deceives his companion, and we'll just stop right there. Unlike previous offenses, which are said to be against God's holy things and unintentional in nature or due to neglect or forgetfulness, the following sins are against God himself and the victim is a companion, a neighbor, or someone close to the person who has sinned knowingly and deliberately. So let's keep reading. It says, in regard to a deposit or a security entrusted to him, or through robbery, or if he has exhorted, uh, extorted, excuse me, from his companion, or has found what was lost and lied about it and sworn falsely, so that he sins in regard to any one of the things a man um, uh, may do. Then it shall be when he sins and becomes guilty that he shall restore what he took by robbery, or what he got by extortion, or the deposit which was entrusted to him, or the lost thing which he found, or anything about which he swore falsely. So the passage describes how one can take another's property sinfully and unlawfully. First of all, um, he held another's goods or property as a deposit or security, but he failed to give it back. That's one form of theft. Or he may have taken something by robbery, a simple theft. Or he may have taken money by extortion, you know, by threatening. Uh, or he found something that was lost by another and he kept it. He didn't report that it was found uh, or lying about, uh, or he lied about its uh, recovery, usually by swearing falsely to cover the theft. You know, I swear I didn't see it, I didn't take it. You know, this is the nature of the sin they're talking about here. So the sin of stealing broke God's eighth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. It violated the neighbor and also sinned against God by making a false vow in order to cover the original uh, sin of theft. So we keep reading in chapter six. He shall make restitution for it in full and add to it one fifth more. He shall give it to the one who, whom, to whom it belongs on the day he presents his guilt offering. Then he shall bring to the priest his guilt offering to the Lord, a ram without defect from the flock, according to your valuation for a guilt offering. 
and the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord and he will be forgiven for any one and it goes on and on. So note that two actions were necessary in order to receive forgiveness for his stealing uh, and lying in order to cover up. First, he had to make uh, restitution. He had to give back to the victim the value of what he stole plus 20% of the value of what was stolen in addition to his restitution. And secondly, he had to make a sacrifice. He had to bring a ram without defect to the priest for sacrifice for his sin to God in order to be forgiven. Now, I want you to notice that the sins mentioned here assumes that the guilty party uh, are revealed and that the guilty party acknowledged uh, their guilt uh, when they realized that they had done in ignorance what was wrong or once having done wrong, confessed his sins because of a guilty conscience or the desire to be right with God or at peace with his neighbor uh, that he had wronged in some way. In either case, he comes to seek to make things right. Whether he did something unintentionally uh, or he did something quite intentionally, he, he comes to acknowledge his wrong uh, before the one that he harmed uh, and before uh, God that he uh, disobeyed. This is why their restitution was only giving back the value of what was stolen plus 20% of its value. In Exodus chapter 22 verses 4 to 9 we read that if uh, one is accused of stealing and found guilty at trial, he had to pay double the value of the goods or the animal that's stolen. So it was better that he acknowledged and went forward and made restitution. He, he simply gave back what he stole plus 20%. If they took him to court and they found him guilty, there he would have to pay double. So not, not only was it a good thing that he, that he acknowledged before man and God his fault, it was also less expensive uh, to, uh, to make things right. Okay, uh, we'll talk about burnt offering, the priest's responsibilities. Now, remember I said they talk about you know, the, the sinner's role and how to make things right in chapter five. And then as you go on to chapter six and seven, they talk about what the priest is supposed to do. So that's where we are now in Leviticus chapter six. When we arrive at this section, it seems that the text repeats itself by going back over the burnt and the grain and the peace and the sin and the guilt offerings. However, the difference is the following. Uh, chapter uh, one, one all, way, all the way to chapter six, verse seven, contained the Lord's instructions to the average Israelite who brought the offering to be sacrificed for various reasons. And then in chapters six, eight, uh, 6.8, all the way to chapter 7.36, uh, those chapters provide the details and responsibilities of the priests who offered the sacrifices as well as the privileges associated with their work. And so aside from the task of making the burnt offerings uh, brought to the tabernacle or to the temple from day to day, the priests had other duties related to the altar itself. And I want to go over those with you now duties of the priests. First, the fire had to burn at all times. Remember I mentioned that. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the fire of the altar had to continually burn. So that meant they had to get the wood and keep it going and clean the ashes and so on and so forth. They had to keep the fire burning. Secondly, the ashes that had built up from burning various sacrifices needed to be removed. So in that situation, the priest would wear his undergarments and put on a linen robe to remove the ashes and put them next to the altar, after which he would change out of these garments and wear other clothing in order to transport the ashes outside of the camp and deposit them in a clean, a ceremonially clean place. Thirdly, the priest uh, would make sure that new wood was added to the altar of burnt offering and begin the day by offering the morning sacrifice. So there was a sacrifice every morning and there was a sacrifice every 
evening. Uh, these were offered and the fire of the altar burnt sacrifices uh, that burned the sacrifices never went out. Now, the priests offered these sacrifices in the morning and you know, burnt sacrifices morning and evening. Uh, this was aside from the sacrifices that people offered when they came throughout the day to the uh, tabernacle complex. And so their task was quite, uh, uh, was quite heavy. Uh, let's talk about grain offerings, the priest's responsibility as far as grain offering is concerned. Um, in Leviticus 2, we have the instructions for the people and how they are to proceed in making a grain offering. Here, God provides instructions for how the priests will handle the uh, offering of grain, and he provides rules for uh, uh, what to do with the rest of the grain that was uh, brought. And so the offerer brought about five to six pounds of white flour, the priest took only a handful of this flour, mixed it with oil and incense and salt, and then threw this handful onto the altar, keeping the rest for himself. The priest made unleavened cakes with the rest of the flour in the courtyard of the uh, tabernacle. It was a holy offering because the grain not burned was actually handled by the priest who was holy. Everything was connected. The priest was holy. Anything he touched became holy. All right. Um, uh, in verses 19 to 23, the Lord adds another offering of grain, this time to be done only by the high priest. It was to be done when a high priest was consecrated or anointed into, into service. Eventually, it was referred to as the ordination offering in Leviticus chapter 7, 37, because it was, it was done when a priest was ordained. A cake was made on a griddle using the fine flour. It was broken into two parts, one offered by the high priest in the morning with the morning sacrifice, and one offered in the evening with the evening sacrifice. The cake was completely burned up with no portion left for the priest. This sacrifice was offered up on behalf of all the priests. Then you have sin offerings and the priest's responsibility for sin offerings in chapter six, verse 24 to 30. Priests were not allowed to eat the flesh of sin offerings made for the high priest or for the congregation since the blood of the animal was poured next to the altar on which it was sacrificed, and some of the blood was also brought into the holy place, and it was sprinkled seven times before the veil that separated the most holy place from the holy place. The priest also put some blood on the horns or the corner of the altar of incense, which stood before the veil leading to the holy of holies. Therefore, because of the extreme holiness of these two sacrifices, you know, the sacrifice for the high priest or the sacrifice for God's people, and the blood that came into the presence of God. Because of this, the entire animal was also offered with nothing left but ashes. Now, other sin offerings involving animals left edible parts of the animal for the priest. After all, it was how they were supplied with food for themselves and their families. However, two boundaries were set. First, the priest had to eat his share within the confines of the tabernacle or the temple complex. And secondly, he couldn't eat the meat of any animals whose blood had come into the holy place because again, the blood of the animal had come into the presence of God. It was most holy, and so none of that animal uh, could be eaten uh, or could be used in any other way. It had to be completely uh, sacrificed. So these type of sacrifices, you know, where the blood was poured or sprinkled in the holy place, they also had additional rules. For example, if a drop of blood stained the priestly garment, then it had to be washed off immediately 
or if the blood that was carried about in an earthen vessel, you know, when they took it inside to the, the holy place to do uh, the ceremonies there with the blood, um, that earthen vessel needed to be destroyed uh, lest some blood seeped into the earthen vessel and, and it was used another time, all right? And uh, silver and bronze vessels that carried blood also had to be thoroughly scoured before reuse. And I think we know by now, we should know the reason for this. The holiness of the sacrifice was determined because of the nearness that it came to God at some point in the ritual. If it stayed out in the courtyard, that was one thing, but if the blood of the sacrifice was brought into the holy place and then before the holy of holies and some of it was on the altar of incense, you know, then it had come into the presence of God. And so, as I mentioned before, that animal uh, that was used in that sacrifice was most holy and none of it could be used uh, or touched by anyone. It was completely, it was completely destroyed. Guilt offerings uh, as far as the priestly responsibility in chapter seven. Chapter seven continues the instructions for the priests concerning their responsibilities, this time for guilt offerings and peace offerings. The main emphasis is on the food that the priests were to receive from the sacrifices that were offered on a daily basis. It details what could and could not be eaten by the priests as well as the rest of God's people. The guilt offering, for example, was performed much like the sin offering, except parts of the animal could be eaten. So we read in Leviticus 7 verse 1, now this is the law of the guilt offering, it is most holy. Now since the sacrifice was most holy, the parts eaten were eaten in a holy place. They had to be within the tabernacle complex and later on in the temple or the courtyard. Unlike the sin offering, the blood of this sacrifice was sprinkled around the altar you know, out in the courtyard, not on its horns, and none of it was brought into the holy place. Therefore, the meat was shared with every male in the priest's family. You see how that worked? In Leviticus 7, verse 7, we read, the guilt offering is like the sin offering. There is one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with it shall have it. And so both sacrifices were similar and questions about one could be answered by examining the details of others. These verses provide information about what portions of the animal and grain sacrifices that the, uh, that the priest could keep for themselves and share with others in the priestly clan. Now we'll stop here for today before we discuss peace offerings, which can become quite involved because there are a lot of different kinds. So we'll start with those next time that we get together. However, I'd like to finish with a few comments on the food regulations and supportive nature of the sacrificial system. So let's talk a bit about the food laws. We see as we study the sacrificial system and we go on to review passages about you know, clean and unclean, in addition to what could and could not be eaten, that one way to separate themselves from other pagan nations was uh, to eat differently than they did. The Jewish food laws in the type and preparation of food serve that purpose. Just as keeping the Sabbath meant that God's people were on a different weekly rhythm than their pagan neighbors and thus were different, were separate, were sanctified, were holy unto God. And this was made evident by these visible differences they had a Sabbath day while everybody else was running around doing the same thing and so on and so forth. You know, the Jews stopped. They worshiped God. They changed their rhythm. And of course, this was necessary in part because the Jews themselves had been heavily influenced by the pagan polyistic religion of Egypt for four centuries. A lot of that Egyptian religion had rubbed off on them. 
So as we study these prohibitions and regulations about Jewish food laws, I want you to keep in mind that as Christians, we are completely free from these or any other food regulations that anyone would try to impose on us today. And someone would say, well, who says so? How do we know this is so? Well, we have three individuals in the New Testament that confirm this idea about food. First, Jesus himself in Mark chapter seven. It's in Mark chapter seven, we read the following. After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand, there's nothing outside the man which can defile him uh, if, he, if, if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles him. Then another individual that you know, declares this idea that Christians are not under food laws is Peter. And we read about him in Acts chapter 10. It says, on the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. But he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and uh, eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him a second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. So right here, just with these two scripture uh, references, uh, Jesus himself and Peter, the apostle, both of them declare that all foods are clean. That uh, the previous laws about food, things you could and couldn't eat and so on and so forth, those have been uh, removed. And then there's a third person uh, that declares the same thing, and that's Paul the Apostle. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in later times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared, uh, shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by means of the word and God uh, 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 by means of the word of God, rather, and uh, prayer. And this is how all food is rendered clean, by prayer and giving of thanks. You wonder sometimes, you know, what, uh, you know, why, 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 why do you say uh, your grace, you know, before meals, you know, at breakfast, or you're in a restaurant, or you're just by yourself, you know, why, why do you do that? Well, because Paul said, all food is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. The word of God here, Jesus, Peter, the word of God tells us all food is permissible. You can eat all foods. There's nothing forbidden to eat. And then he says, and prayer. Uh, prayer is acknowledgement that all food comes from God and we give thanks to him for it. So how do we sanctify? How do we bless? How do we make clean everything we eat? by acknowledging that God is the one who has given to us and permits us to do so, and by giving him thanks for what he has done. 
I just thought it would be a good point in our, in our lesson here to uh, underscore this idea for Christians. Just remember what we're studying is Jewish law, uh, laws that were for Jews for a particular purpose and training them to be God's uh, people and to be separate from the pagan nations around them. These food laws no longer apply to us as Christians. Uh, I just want us to kind of, you know, get up above the, the cloud of what we're studying uh, to see the bright sunshine of Christianity here before we dive, we dive right back in. So freedom in Christ is uh, freedom from uh, food laws. Well, I encourage you to uh, continue uh, going on and on. Uh, we're going to talk about the sacrificial system here for a moment. There we go. As we continue through uh, Leviticus, we're going to read more about the portions of the animal and grain and wine offerings that were kept by the priests, their families, as well as the Levites who assisted the priests in their work. The sacrificial system was a self-supporting system. When the Israelites arrived at the promised land, uh, it was divided among the tribes according to their size, according to their uh, population. Every tribe received a portion of land. Uh, the tribe of Joseph, for example, received two portions, one for each of his sons, one for Manasseh and one for Ephraim. But there was no land for the tribe of Levi from which came the priests uh, from the family of Aaron and the Levites themselves who, that came from other families in the tribe of uh, Levi. Uh, it was uh, told them that the Lord himself was to be their portion. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 2. And they were given 48 cities among the tribes in which uh, they would leave, uh, live. Cities and also tracts of land where they could cultivate food and, and so on and so forth. So the priests were supported by the sacrifices brought by the people, a portion of which they kept. The Levites and the maintenance of the tabernacle and temple were supported by the 10% tithe that the people donated, of which the Levites gave 10% to the high priest. So uh, the tithes that the people brought to the tabernacle, 10% of those were uh, given to the Levites to support them and, and, and their work. And then the Levites took 10% of what they received and they passed that along to the high priest in order to support him and his family and the work that he did. When the people were faithful, the sacrificial uh, system supported uh, their place of worship along with those chosen by God to minister to their uh, spiritual needs by the offering of various sacrifices and officiating at the different holy days and festivals throughout their uh, religious calendar. If the people were unfaithful, uh, then the system and its ministers fell into disuse and decay and the people were cut off from God since there was no other way to approach or to connect with God at the time except through the sacrificial system. It was the spiritual lifeline between God and his people. Well, we'll stop right here. I, I was a little premature before, but we'll stop right here this time. And I encourage you to uh, read again, uh, chapters seven, eight, and nine, uh, so that you're familiar with the text as you can see, as we you know, go through the uh, book of Leviticus, I only read just particular passages you know, to comment on so that, we, uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, we're able to uh, get some context uh, as to where we are in our uh, study. But I don't have time to read the entire chapters. I leave that to you so that you can be familiar with that. Okay, well, that's our uh, lesson for this time. Uh, lesson six, uh, we'll pick up lesson seven next time we uh, get together. God bless you. Thank you for your attention.